Hello, my name is uh, Kian Wormsley. Welcome to this session on Autodesk's research into digital twins in the AEC space. I'm going to be talking to you today about a number of projects we've done um, as part of Project Dasher. So you can contact me via e email, my address is there. I also have a blog at kianw.com and I'm on social media, LinkedIn, uh, Twitter, etc. at kianw. So looking back a little bit, um, we, we started our research into digital twins in the AEC space before we were talking about digital twins, really. So this is going back to late 20, 2009, um, early 2010. And so we, we started to map out what we considered to be, um, in this case, a digital twin, I'm not calling it that. But to start with, the main piece that we wanted to integrate was accurate ge geometry information. And in this case, we started with BIM, so taking taking data from from Revit. Um, we also then want to wanted to integrate, particularly integrate real world data. So in this case, that meant taking data from a BMS, uh, building management system, and IoT sensors. Uh, we didn't worry too much about control. This was always something that we knew we could do, and the same is for calibrated simulations. It's something we're starting to look at now. Um, but it, it hasn't been hasn't been a core focus for this particular project. Um, but we also we did want to integrate tools for understanding data and making future predictions. In this case, this included um, you know graphical display of sensor data, something called surface shading, which takes sensor data and maps it on to the volume of a room or onto something like a bridge. And, and the ability to navigate different um, time at different scales. So all of these things, three things kind of pulled together, we considered a building debugger. So this is what um, Project Dasher was. And this was ultimately um, a tool that would allow building owners to explore the you you know how their their building performs in the real world. In this case, we're we're looking at, at, at the the energy consumption for a floor of a building, then a zone of a building, and even down to an individual cubicle. You know, we could also use this tool. This is the original desktop version of Dasher going back to you know 2010. You can see in the timeline there, February 2011. So this is this is quite old now. Um, part of my job coming into research. Um, you know, when, when I joined research, I've been with the company for a long time, but I joined research in 2016. And my first job was to help um, build a Forge-based version of, of Project Dasher. So this is Dasher 360, actually displaying data from a previous project that we did for NASA. Um, and this is, you know, back, back when we first presented this, this type of visualization to the team at NASA, they identified, identified a couple of key areas that were of interest. The first was that this uh, central region here um, was a lot cooler than the rest of the floor. This is a, a, a heat map displaying the temperature for this particular floor of the building. So we have this cooler area, but they, but they said, well, that's where the data, data center is. So our servers are there. It's normal that it should be cooler. But they also noticed that this room had a very different temperature profile from the rest of the floor. And somebody present, um, you know, put up their hand and said, ah, yes, well, that's what, that's because we're doing, um, that probably because we're doing this experimental glazing study in that room. So they had clearly probably put some sort of photovoltaic, oh, sorry, not photovoltaic, um, anti-ultraviolet film on the, on the windows that would help reduce the amount of, of, of um, temperature increase coming from, from the sun. Uh, so that was, they hadn't crunched the numbers on the study at this point, but it was the first indication to them that, um, that there was some value in, the, in this study, but it was also um, an aha moment for the project in the sense, you know, we, we, we literally had um, people take the tool such as Dasha and, and, and glean genuine insights from um, the data that was being presented more so than they would have done if it'd been locked away in a, in a graph or in, inside a database table. So the next project that we worked on was for Schneider Electric. <clears throat> in this case, this was much. This is more about correlation. They they had um, a new occupancy sensor that could give positional information of where people were inside a building, and you can see them here inside this building of theirs um, as like these purple Playmobil people, and we, we'd sort of um, 
showing them all over the, you know, wherever, wherever the, the sensor would indicate they were, in conjunction with a, with a heat map displaying CO2 levels. So there we can see in that particular room, the heat map has gone bright pink to indicate a high CO2 le value for that room. And obviously we can see from the, all the, you know, the people in that room that, that, that it's due to excessive occupancy. So here we can dig into the data. We're going to pull up the sensor for that particular room. Um, we can zoom out on it and start to make sense of whether this is a problem that happens regularly. Is it something that we need to correct the BMS for um, in, in order to avoid these, these kind of situations where the CO2 levels spike in the future? But here we can really zoom out all the way on the data and say, well, how often does this happen? Is it every day? Is it every week? Is it every month? You know what, what changes might we need to make in order to support this kind of usage. So that was the first um, real area where we started, we were correlating data from multiple different types of sensors. Um, we also had started looking into infrastructure. So this is our first project related to infrastructure. And I'll explain why we went down this path in a little while. We'll talk about the project shortly. Um, but this is the Pier 9 office in San Francisco. And there's a raised walkway that we decided to instrument with accelerometers and strain gauges um, and various other sensors, as well as cameras, so that we could start to correlate the usage of the bridge with the sensor data it was reporting, and really start to understand um, <clears throat> how the bridge performed, but also you know, to understand the context. Um, so in this case, we're going to navigate through to a 3D view looking across the bridge now here, um, what, we, what we're going to, to, to do is to sort of pull up this 3D, uh, sorry, this video um, footage integrated into this particular view. And here we can see a, a security guard walking across the, the, um, the bridge early in the morning, checking his phone. And we can literally pick up the individual footsteps in the data, but having the video allows us to correlate and you know the, the the observed usage along with the performance data at the same time. Um, now this is clearly of interest, but at the same time, having um, video footage integrated into a tool such as Dasher meant that we had to restrict access to this particular project because, of course, it's it's considered sensitive data. So we started down the path of looking at how we might anonymize this, this sort of video footage. And the, in earlier efforts related to blurring of faces, um, we then started to pull out uh, skeleton data from frame by frame from the video. Um, here's a, a, you know, a, a large scale test that we did at Autodesk University 2017 on the exhibit floor. Um, but then we would take that data and reintegrate it back into Dasha. So here we have, um, you know, this is our first attempt to visualize the, this, this, this information in, inside the Forge Viewer inside Dasha. Um, now, all of this was really to support a project for a startup in the Netherlands called MX3D. Now, MX3D, um, you may have heard of this project, it's quite an, um, an iconic project that we've been involved in from, from its inception. It was the original. <clears throat> Um, vision for this project was to have uh, welding robots uh, essentially building a bridge across a canal in Amsterdam, you know, going from one side to the other or joining in the middle. The, the, this is sort of how the, the vision ended up morphing. Now, we were originally involved in um, a generative, you know, the generative design process of the bridge. But for various reasons, um, the, the decision was made to, to use a much more artistic design. So we, we, we shifted our focus away from the design aspect and more onto, well, as it's a brand new building material, and you can see it being kind of deposited here, you know, how is this bridge going to perform? So in spite of there being various tests on the bridge, and this is one of them where, you know, members of the project team, me included, you know, jumped up and down on the bridge, there'd already been a significant load test prior to this, so it wasn't really a, a major concern. But you know, aside from these, the the this sort of testing, we um, wanted to have information from the bridge to understand well is how is it performing in the middle of winter versus the middle of summer. You know, are there are there potential issues around maintenance that we can foresee? Um, so the team integrated a network of sensors, so accelerometers, inclinometers load cells, uh, strain gauges, thermistors, 
etc. So this, this is an early schematic. I think it may we may even have included more in the end. But you know, upwards of ninety sensors on on integrated into this bridge. The effort to actually pull the you know the the, the put the sensors in the bridge was significant. So Autodesk research participating in this alongside a number of, of academic partners who, who helped with this effort. Um, so here's Alex Tessier, um, a main, uh, you know, one, one of the leaders of this project who's, you know, rolling up his sleeves and getting, getting involved as well. Now, the idea was that, of course, we'd be able to take uh, the skeleton data, such as we, we, we looked at previously for PR9, and start to correlate that with the, the, the stress data. Now, this is an early test of the skeletonization where we're looking at the video feed synchronized with the skeleton data. And there you can see um, uh, Casper Siderius so from the MX3D team walking along the bridge at Dutch Design Week. And you can see that it maps very well with the skeleton. Um, interestingly, if we flip the 3D view, so we rotate round and look from the other angle, here we can actually see we had a problem with this particular camera um, homography. So in this case, the, the, the guy sitting on the handrail on the right hand side, he's, he's on the, the correct handrail, but he's flipped. You know, you can see that he's sitting backwards and the same for the, for the lady in the white jacket taking the photo. You can see that she's, she's standing a bit backwards and the person sitting on the step as well. So there was definitely an issue that we needed to address there um, in terms of the transformation. But ultimately, the goal is, of course, with this project, is that we don't need the video footage anymore. Once we've debugged it, we can throw the video away, and then we can start to correlate the, the movement of people across the bridge with the strain on the bridge, which we can map onto the surface of the bridge using uh, a heat map, just as we've seen before. So this is, this is starting to come to fruition now. Um, we have, um, this is a, a sort of a, a more up-to-date visualization of, of how we are displaying skeletons, which are now um, properly three-dimensional. In the past, they were almost 2.5D in the sense they were, they were in a 3D plane, but they were in a plane. So they would be planar, but at a certain distance from the camera. Now uh, we've improved our computer vision pipeline so that it's really creating 3D skeletons. And, and here you can see it sort of displayed against the heat map. So the good news is the bridge has been installed in Amsterdam. Um, here, in fact, at the bottom of the screen there, you can see the, this, this, this person, that's me. I was there for the opening. This is the, the Queen Maxima of the Netherlands who, who um, kindly came to, to open the bridge at the grand opening. Um, I was actually back at the bridge this week for a, for a follow-up conference. We... Um, <clears throat> We have yet to install the cameras. We'll have a couple of cameras, ideally have a couple of cameras here and a couple of cameras on this side, which would allow us to do the skeletonization. We've done skeletonization in the past with just one camera, um, but here this would give us um, better coverage and, and, a, and a more three-dimensional result. So that is a work in progress. It's still ongoing. We're hoping that that, that will, um, th those cameras will get installed in the coming months. Now, um, since MX3D, we've, we've engaged on, on another smart bridge uh, com, um, project, in this case for Dar El Handasa, it's a, a global construction company from Lebanon. Um, so in this case, it was to take, in some ways, go, go beyond the MX3D vision, really have a generatively designed bridge created from sustainable materials. So in this case, it's kind of a mixture of, of um, plastics of some, some sort of ABS uh, alongside carbon fiber, which is you know all very recyclable. Um, this is just a two meter prototype bridge. Uh, we integrated uh, sensors that were, are basically optical fiber based, so they're known as FBG or fiber Bragg's grating sensors for the strain. Uh, these have been integrated into the structure of the bridge, both into the bed itself, but then by sort of drilling uh, or milling channels along the structures, integrating them, and then covering it up with silicon. So we, we have this extensive network of sensors throughout the, the structure of the bridge. Um, here is the bridge on display at a trade show in, um, in <clears throat> excuse me, in Dubai. We've since shown the bridge in um, at, at BIM World in Paris as well. And, and just this week, it's at Digital Construction Week in London. Now the bridge, when we start to look at the data coming off the bridge, here's a, a bit of a capture of, of this data. 
uh, or, or show how it gets mapped onto the, the, the surface, the structure of the bridge itself. Here, we're turning on the sensors. Um, we're spinning it around and able to, you know, visualize the, the, the sensor data, the, you know, the, the values of the sensors at the individual sensor locations via the dots, but we can also turn on surface shading and sort of start to see that the, those stresses, you know, the com uh, compression, um, expansion of the, of the bridge <clears throat> on, on the structure of the bridge itself. So this is the kind of visualization we're able to see. We've also enabled um, a very interesting kind of real-time mode with the bridge as well, where as people are walking across the bridge, you can see the uh, stress live on the bridge, on the bridge's structure, which is, which is very interesting too. So uh, a couple more comments about other projects we've worked on. This is the Nest building, in, which is a, a collaboration between uh, ETH Zurich and the Swiss Material Science Institute, EMPA. Um, so it's a highly modular building where units are essentially swapped out on a regular basis or could be swapped out on a regular basis. This um, unit, for example, is the urban mining and recycling unit. Everything inside that unit has a material passport. Um, th it's a showcase for digital fabrication. There are a number of, of tech, you know, uh, 3D printing of concrete has been used to create walls and a very lightweight uh, roof called the high-low roof. So it's a very interesting project for us to be involved in. There are upwards of 2000 sensors in the building and we've taken a subset of those sensors and have integrated them into Project Asher. So here we can kind of see, um, <clears throat> you know, a, a, a user interface that we built in order to navigate down to a particular floor and a particular type of sensor. Uh, you can see that we've, we've integrated two-dimensional heat maps, which allows us once again to correlate multiple st uh, streams of data at the same time. So here we can see humidity, CO2 and temperature all at the same time with the humidity being also shown as, the, as a, a heat map in, in the middle. Uh, with, with, you know, it's all about correlating data. Here we have um, a view where we're kind of looking at, at data coming in um, or, or being displayed for a multiple, you know, a, a, a multitude of sensors at the same time. So we can really start to, to understand this sort of interplay between different sensors, understand really what's happening. Uh, we've also done experiments with um, integrating data from building systems. So this is a project for Kingspan in their ICON headquarters in Ireland. Uh, and here we, we, we had a very detailed BIM model from them and we were able to enable this kind of X-ray mode so we can explore the, the, the mechanical and uh, electrical systems of the building at the same time as, as other types of data as well. This is that same building, but looking at uh, sensors across multiple floors and multiple types. So we have for both the first and second floor of the building, we have temperature, humidity, CO2 and sound data that's all being displayed together, which hopefully can, can provide some insights um, for, for the person examining the data. Um, now, in terms of where this fits into to Autodesk's overall vision for digital twins or where our, our research vision at least. So we've, we've talked a lot about in the past about generative design where we take sort of a, a model, we generate it, we evaluate it and evolve it algorithmically. Um, well, so once it's been selected and implemented, the, the IoT aspect comes in later on and we can start to take this data and essentially close the loop on this process, feed data back into the generate cycle so that for the next iteration of the, of, of the object, whether it's a building or a bridge, et cetera, um, we can essentially improve it based on real world performance data, which is getting more and more accurate and, you know, and eventually, you know, essentially or continually optimize the design process. Now, a few words now in terms of what has happened with Dasha. So um, a lot of the work that we've done inside Dasha, particularly the heat maps and the sensor dots um, and the timeline have been built into the Forge platform for Forge developers to build their own uh, digital twins. Effectively, you can build your own Dasha with, it, with enough effort. So that's one aspect. So this is a more sort of developer-centric approach. 
But the tandem team has also you know, been heavily inspired by the project. Um, they're now in the process of building in uh, connected features into, into tandem. So this is um, a little sort of capture from the a April 2022 tandem webinar that I, I, I also presented at. So you can find that on the tandem uh, website. And here you can start to see some very Dasher-like features being integrated into, into the feature set. And we have members of the Dasher team, particularly Halle Larson, who's moved across into the Tandem team as a product manager who's really helping drive the integration of these Dasher-like features into Tandem. So that is the end of my presentation. Thank you very much for uh, your attention. I hope you've found it useful and please do reach out to me if you have any questions. Thank you.